Now, hope is a vision for better days ahead. But hope doesn't just give us only a future vision. It also transforms us here in the now, here in the present. And at Advent, we are invited as the people of God into a journey of real and lasting hope, a hope that we find in Jesus Christ. The Advent season is a a season where we stand right in the middle of two kind of different realities. Advent means the arrival. It means the coming. And as we enter into the Advent season, we are reminded that there was indeed an arrival, right? There was a, a coming that has already occurred, that has already happened, that being the birth of Jesus Christ, our, our Lord. But along with that, we as Christians, we, we stand kind of looking back to what has already happened. We also need to find ourselves looking forward to what will come, to what will happen in the future. See, there was this arrival that has already happened, the birth of our Savior. And then there's this next arrival that is coming that will happen with the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we sit in the present, in the here and now. Here we sit in the tension of the what has and the what will be. We live in the middle of that tension. We are a people who are filled with longing, filled with expectation of that which is to come. And at the same time, we look back in remembrance during this Advent season. And those two come together. Now, I remember back to my childhood. One particular Christmas with grand embarrassment personally. There's probably a bunch of Christmases I should be embarrassed about, but there's one Christmas in my childhood that that stands out above and beyond all the rest. We were at my grandparents' house. We were opening Christmas presents. We did this every year, Christmas Day. That's the way my family goes. We'd get there Christmas morning after opening presents at my parents' home. We'd go over to my grandparents' house. We eat lunch. We open presents. Man, it's great. And then we go to my other grandparents' house after that and then eat supper and open more presents. It was like the present bonanza as a kid, right? All in one day, just boom. You'd go home with, like, like my brother and I, we had a 79 Pontiac Ventura, right? Some of you remember those. And we'd just be like jam-packed in the back seat with toys piled up all around us, right? Well, this one particular year I want to tell you about, my, my grandparents decided, I don't know if they were trying to play a trick on me or, or what they were doing, but they decided to put something in a box that they had purchased for me and then wrapped it. And now I had opened a number of other presents at this point, and... and regarded most of them with general disinterest. I mean, nothing I had opened up yet really wowed me, right? And it really spoke to me as a kid. None none of those things that were like, oh, here's the gift that I've been waiting for, right? Nothing really caught my eye. Yeah, I was a selfish kid, okay? uh, Let's be transparent. (laughs) I was. But this package... It had potential, folks. Now, you need to know as part of the story, my grandmother is a gift-wrapping ninja. Every package, perfect. Like, mathematically perfect. Like, you, you you can, like, do geometric formulations off of her folds, right? You know people like that? That's my grandma. And not only does she do that, but then she gets that ribbon out, and this stuff is as strong as, like, tow ropes. And, and she gets it on there, and, and I swear, she gets a couple teams of horses pulling in both directions to tie that bow. It's so tight on there, right? When you cut it, it goes ping when that ribbon lets go. You ever seen those? Like, you got to watch out because it might pop up in the eye. That's how my grandma wraps presents. I mean, it, it, it's a thing to behold. It's a thing of beauty. They're, they're awesome. And so... I have this box. My anticipation is high. So excitedly, I pop off that ribbon, right? Excitedly, I start tearing through the paper. There's a box, and usually boxes mean good things. I rip open the box. I reach in the box. I lift it out. And then I scream loudly, Nobody wants socks for Christmas! 
and I threw them on the floor in a fit of anger. Right? True, true story. I'm sure my mother is still embarrassed to this day. The shame that brought my family. Oh my goodness. But the reality of the story is that it says more about me, of course, than it really does about the gift. But I think you can identify with putting your hopes into something, right? I put my hopes into that box. The longing, the waiting, the, the hoping, the eagerly anticipating what, what it will be. Only then in the end to be left disappointed. Only then in the end to be let down, right? This little story is kind of a microcosm of the bigger stories that we tell in our lives. It's this idea of misplaced hope, right? You've done it. I've done it. There are things and and there there are people and situations that we place our hope in that are ultimately going to disappoint us. And for some of us, we're putting our hopes into a person or a a government or a system or an ideology that can never live up to our expectations. We're putting it into things like our personal success or maybe a future promotion or getting into the right college or getting onto the right team or getting the right job, whatever it might be. We place our hope in a thousand different areas. And not only do we often misplace our hope, But the thing is, the things that we put our hope in, they're broken, right? We're broken. We're a broken people living in a broken world. And what happens when you pour water into a broken vessel? It starts to leak out, doesn't it? It leaks out everywhere and makes a mess. The reality is that on this side of heaven, it's going to leak. It's going to be messy. The things we put our hope in are going to fail us if we put our hopes into the wrong things. The question I want to answer, or ask at least, the very, very least this morning, but hopefully answer this morning, the question I want to answer is that if everything leaks our hopes, then what or who can actually hold my hope? If you think about the word hope, it's a word that we use in our daily vernacular, right? It's part of our vocabulary. We, we use hope a lot. This word comes up on an almost daily basis. You know, like, I hope it stops snowing because I really don't want a snow blow today, Right? I wish I could say I hope the Vikings win today, but they already lost this week. (laughs) Man. Way to ruin my week. But we use that word, right? I hope my in-laws leave soon. I hope I don't overspend for Christmas. Well, you know. My in-laws aren't here, so I can say that. I like my in-laws. They're good folks. I hope hope those extra pounds I gain over the holidays will quickly shut off, right? Right? I hope the kids do well in school. We hope, we hope, we hope. We use it all the time. Now in the scriptures, the word hope is used over 200 times. And then as you begin to pull those references out and you begin to examine them, you begin to look at them in the New Testament and then throughout the whole Bible, you can summarize them as something kind of like this. Hope means a confident expectation in the future. It means to have a a, a contagious enthusiasm for that which is to come. The idea of hope is that, that you're looking forward to a future with enthusiasm, with confidence, with expectation. And then within that, then within the biblical use of hope, that there will be a blessing in the end of it. So, scripturally speaking, hope is a very good thing. If we ask the question, if everything leaks, who or what then can I put my hope into? Well, I want to try to answer that question today by looking at a verse. And this comes from Romans 15. If you've got a Bible, there's pew Bibles. If you've got a phone, 
Open up your Bible on your phone or your iPad or whatever you got. Feel free. We're going to be in Romans 15, 13 for the rest of the day today. And as you're turning to Romans 15, 13, let, let me set up the book of Romans for you. Let me give you a little background on the book of Romans. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, and this is his letter to the church in Rome. And it's basically considered his magnum opus. It's his crown jewel. It's his masterpiece as far as his writing goes. In the book of Romans, Paul outlines through chapters 1 through 11 this, this just beautiful bedrock of theology. And then he, he begins to talk to all of us at that point about being condemned before the Lord. But then in, within that, he talks about this good and gracious God who has made a way out of that condemnation for us. So it's a, a very appropriate thing for us on this day as we're going to celebrate communion in just a moment. It's, it's a wonderful thing for us to dig in at this point and look at it. Within the stories of, of Romans, Paul talks about the promises that were given to Abraham. In chapter 5, he talks about justification. In chapter 6 and 7, he talks about sanctification. Those are fancy kind of seminary words. And then in chapter 8, he talks about glorification. And then he talks about God calling people to himself. And so he's just kind of laying out these beautiful truths of our salvation. And then in chapter 12, he kind of turns and he begins talking about how these truths aren't just some old dusty ideas that we can put up on a shelf, but that they're actually working themselves out in our day-to-day -day lives as we live out our faith. So chapter 12 is really an interesting point in the book of Romans if you haven't read it recently. And then he continues on in 13, 14, and 15 in kind of that same stream of thought. And then he closes, as we're going to see today. He doesn't close the book because he writes some more stuff after this, but the verse that we're going to look at today, chapter 13 in Romans 15, is kind of like a benediction of sorts, a, a closing prayer of sorts to all of the stuff that he's just said. And Paul is laying out all of these promises that, that God has given to the Jews and that God has given to the Gentiles. And he basically ends his letter here with verse 15 saying, this is my prayer for you, for you the church. In this case, the, the Roman church, but for the church universal. And it's like in this moment, Paul had just kind of penned through the power of the Holy Spirit just this unbelievable doctrine treatise. It's the good stuff. Romans is, is great reading. And so he laid out this compelling, rich theology of all of what God has done through us or for us through Christ. And then he talks about how these truths work themselves out in our daily lives. And then, like I said, it's almost as if then at this point, Paul's like, I've written all this great stuff. And then he sits down and he takes a few deep breaths and just kind of pens out this beautiful prayer that we're going to examine. In verse 13, Paul says this. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's look at that first part. May the God of hope. Here, here's my point. If you walk away with nothing else today, walk away with this. Praise the Lord in this. That God is both the source of hope as well as the supplier of hope, right? God is the source and supplier of our hope. You see, Paul puts this right in there, gets it going right out of the gate. May the God of hope. Here he's declaring something that is the very essence and nature of God. God is not just the inspirer of hope. He authors hope. He doesn't just kind of randomly dole out some hope. Hope describes the essence of who God is. And it's not just that God is giving hope, but it's descriptive of his very nature, of his character. This is the God we serve. He is a God of hope. And the beautiful truth about this reality is that hope is, Hope isn't based on some numbers, on some probabilities. 
but rather hope is based on the promises given to us by our God. Let me see if I can flesh that out for you a little bit. The hopes that you and I have in our day-to-day lives. All these things down here on this kind of earthly level are hopes, right? The things that tend to be our misplaced hopes, right? They're based on probabilities. When I, when I look at my retirement account, I look at it saying, well, I hope it grew, right? When I look at my bank account, I look at it saying, well, I hope there's still money in it, right? That's the kind of hope I'm talking about, based on probability, based on kind of a, a wish that that hope may or may not actually be true. Now, whether it's a person or a thing or a system or a spouse, whatever it is that you're banking on with probabilities, the reality is it's probably going to fail you at some point, right? That's the way that it works. We're a broken people living in a broken world. But with the God of hope, it's different, right? What promises of God has he never fulfilled? Not a one, he's failed. When you put your hope in God, you're putting your hope in his promises. You're banking on the promises that God himself has made. In the book of Titus, Paul says, and this is a God who cannot lie. When he promises to do these things, he will see to it that they are done. The promises that God has placed over your life, that God has spoken into your life through Scripture, those things can and will happen. His Son will return. You really are not condemned in Christ. You really are forgiven and cleansed if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You really have been made new. You really have been reconciled with God, your Father in heaven. You really have been redeemed. You really will have a resurrected body on the other side of heaven. These are the promises of God. This will happen. This is not probability. This is the word of God. Our hope is not based on probabilities, but on promises. Paul says, may the God of hope, may the one who authors it, may the one who has sourced it, may the origin of hope, may this God of hope, may he do something to fill you. I just love those words he goes on. He says, may God fill you. May God, when you fill something, fill it to the top, overflowing right? This is the God of abundance, not the God of scarcity. Everything is his. There's no limitations. This is the God of abundance, and when he fills, he fills it full to the top to overflowing. And Paul says, may he fill you with what? Paul says, may he fill you with joy and peace. When Paul begins to talk here about joy, a a beautiful thing, Paul uses the word joy more than any other New Testament author. He uses it 21 times, in fact. And when Paul speaks about joy, it's it's like, remember the song from when you were kids? I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, right? Down in my heart, down in my heart. Anybody else want to sing with me? I'm not the only one who sang that, right? Okay. Okay. Paul talks about joy. He says, this joy, this is a mark of a true Christian, right? Joy, peace, patience, understanding, kindness, and things like that, right? So what is Paul talking about when he talks about joy? Paul's talking about this inward satisfaction of the soul. He's not talking about having a bubbly personality. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about, you know, that smiling, sugary, saccharine, sweet disposition. I mean, that's okay. It's not bad if that's you, but that's not what he's talking about. 
He's talking about an inward satisfaction of the soul that wells up with delight in knowing God. In knowing that you are God the Father's son or daughter. This joy, this inward satisfaction of the soul is different than the superficial realities that most of us deal with on a day-to-day basis. And so Paul is praying that the people of God would be filled with joy and then also with peace, right? He says joy and peace. Peace is a little bit different than joy. Joy is that inward satisfaction of the soul. Peace, though, is this rest. Peace is contentment, right? Peace is an ease in your soul that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. Joy relates to the delight, to the, to the anticipation. Peace results from the assurance that God will indeed fulfill the promises, that God will indeed bring us his hope. And so what Paul is talking about here, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, right? And what Paul is praying is that the God of hope would fill you with evidence of the fruit of the Spirit at work in your day-to-day life. I mean, think about Galatians 5. Paul writes the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, right? And so on. And then he goes on in the, here in Romans and says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing. A beautiful interplay on the work that God is doing in and through each and every one of his followers. That little bit of in believing, he says there. This is a neat little thread that you can follow through the book of Romans, this in believing idea. It means that you've placed your love, you've placed your trust, you've placed your confidence, your faith in the one who was sent to redeem and reconcile you, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Paul's been arguing all the way through the whole book of Romans is that although we are condemned, that God made a way for us. How? Through his son. Although we were condemned, although we were without hope, God himself sent his son to reconcile us, broken, lost people in a broken, lost world. Scripture says, even yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This phrase in believing is you and me putting our our belief, our trust, our confidence, our hope in the one who came to save us, the one who reconciled us, the one who died in our place. Then the Apostle Paul goes on. And, and he says two words that you might not think to be significant, but they are. He says, so that. This is kind of a turn in his prayer. Where Paul is going to turn and he's going to outline the why behind the what. Here he's going to say, this is why I want this for you. This is why, church, Paul says, I am praying for you. So that you would be filled with joy and with peace. Why? so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope, right? You can see in this verse, he, he starts it with hope. He ends it with hope. It's like the bookends holding everything together in this passage. The God of hope is longing for you and for me, longing for us to abound in hope. And the good news, folks, the good news is that the one who supplies hope has more than enough hope for all of us. An abundant supply. How good is that to hear on a morning where some of us come in maybe dragging a little bit? Where some of us maybe come in with the weight of the world on our shoulders, right? 
But the truth of the matter is there's not a single person here today who doesn't need to hear this. We all need to hear about the hope. Because who doesn't need hope? I need hope. We all need hope. There's not a one of us here who doesn't need hope. And the good news for you is this. Hear this. Is that God has hope for you. Not just a rationed out little bit of hope. Not just, here's a little taste and I'll give you a little bit more tomorrow and maybe a little bit more just to kind of string you along just so you have barely enough hope to get by. No. Lavish, rich, full, abundant hope. That's what God wants to supply. That is the hope that Jesus Christ gives. That is the hope the Apostle Paul prays for, for his church, for his people. And that is my hope as I pray for you as well. That God would give you the hope that would fill you with joy and with peace in your believing so that you too might abound in hope by the power of the Spirit. So here's my application for you for this for the next couple of weeks. The next couple of weeks are going to be busy, right? It happens every year. It's not a surprise. The season comes and we get busy. The season is full of distractions. And if nothing else, you get the Hallmark Channel, like I talked about last week. (laughs) If that can't distract you, there's other stuff. There's bowl games for football. The playoffs are almost here for football. Just football is distracting, period. Football? No, really. There's a lot of things going on, though, right? You've got parties. You've got gifts. You've got work. You've got events. You've got shopping. You've got travel. You've got all kinds of stuff. And whatever it is, many, if not all of us, are going to be a little busy, right? Don't let that pull you away, though. Resist the temptation to coast spiritually, to get distracted in the season. Be intentional about getting into God's Word. Pick it up. Read your Bible. Get into God's Word. Pray. Be intentional about having a a quiet time. It's easy to have all the Christmas music on, to watch all the Christmas videos, to watch Charlie Brown, which I love Charlie Brown's Christmas story, right? Love that story. It's easy to watch Frosty. It's easy to... We watched Rudolph the other night. And of course, you've got to have Tom Hanks on the train. It, w- it wouldn't be Christmas. <laughs> right? Polar Express. But be intentional. Get out. Serve others. Be generous. Give to others. Get out in the community. Love others. If you don't know Jesus, now is a great, great, great time to start reading your Bible for the first time, maybe. Read the Christmas story for the first time, maybe. Read it for yourself. Then, then go on and read the book of John, maybe, right? See where God might lead you. And then second, this one might be even a little bit harder yet. I would challenge you to courageously identify some of the things that you've misplaced your hope in. Some of those things that even now that are broken, that you are putting your hope in. Some of those things, some of those places, some of those people. Realizing all vessels leak. Everything is broken. Everything that isn't Jesus Christ is, can, and will fail at some point. Can't deliver. Name them for what they are. False hope. Be honest about it. What have you been putting your hope in? Maybe even go so far as to share that with somebody else in your life. Somebody you trust. Say, boy, I've been putting my hope into this, but it's, that's not where my hope should be. That hope doesn't come from the promises of God. As I close, I want to remind you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That is true. As we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
God goes with me. That is true. God's rod, God's staff, they comfort me. That is true. Despite the fact that I am broken, despite the fact that sometimes I feel dirty, despite the fact that I feel shame, despite the fact that I am a sinner, despite all of that, I am a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. The great price has been paid for me by Jesus. I have been redeemed. This is true. For you to be washed over again in all these promises, folks. I'm not saying this season is going to be any less busy or not. I'm not saying it's going to be any less tiring or any less frustrating. But my hope is that if you do these two things, be intentional and focused about your faith journey in the next few weeks, and be open and honest about where you have falsely been putting your hope, that in that, you'll be able to capture again that spirit and find within that the hope that comes from the promises and not from probabilities. Because we have a God who forgives, who heals, who restores, and who redeems. Put your hope in that. Amen. Let's pray.